Thank you so much for joining with us this uh, Pentecost weekend uh, when we remember God's Spirit poured out. But we just don't want to remember a historical event. We want to tell you that because we serve a risen Saviour, that his transforming power is available today. Be blessed and encouraged as you listen to this message from Mark Hewitt this morning. Hello, Sender Church. It's uh, a real delight to be with you again today. Um, and indeed, this is a, a very special occasion to be with you. This is the, the day of Pentecost. This is the moment in which the church was birthed on the earth, became a, a living organism, an organism that was designed to move in the power of the Spirit and to declare the beautiful and glorious message of the gospel. And so we celebrate this day and, and, and we know that this day holds massive significance for us as a body. And we are in the midst of one of the craziest time in human history. Indeed, the generation in which we live have, have never faced anything like what we're facing at this moment. So we kind of have to ask ourselves the question, what is happening? And what do we think God is doing at this time? I don't believe for one second it's any coincidence that, that this pandemic has come um, right in the midst of Passover and in the midst of Pentecost. And we know the historical narrative concerning Passover, how the children of Israel were shut up in their homes in Egypt. They were avoiding, they were being protected, if you like, by this, this plague that, that came and, and, of course, afflicted the Egyptians themselves, but the Israelites were preserved. And indeed, we think about this. We, we think that the church at large as a body has gone through a literal Passover. We, we've experienced that ourselves. We've been pushed into our homes We've had to avoid a plague. We've been pleading the blood of Jesus. We've been applying the blood and, uh, and pleading the name of Jesus over our homes at this time so that we would be protected from this plague. And now we are in the midst of Passover. And I do believe that, that something very special is going to happen to the church. I do believe that we are going to experience a literal baptism of the Spirit a baptism of love, a baptism of power. Because brother and sister, I don't know about you, but I need it. I need it. I need to know the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. Because it's an interesting thing, you know, that Jesus commanded his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And that's the commandment that we've been so good at following. But the other commandment was this. There was a second commandment, and it was wait. Wait until you are endued, or until you are clothed with power from on high. And my dear brother and sister, I'll be the first to put my hand up and say, I have not waited for this power. I have not waited for the promise of the Father. And that's something that we have to hone in on, that, that this is a promise from our Father in heaven. And it's ours by blood right and birthright. But we have to wait for it. And I haven't waited. <laughs> I haven't waited. And I've tried to, to do, to orchestrate my Christian experience in my own flesh and by my own strength. And that's why I'm so burned out and through other and weary. And I'm sure I'm talking to hearts today and you feel exactly like that. And I do believe that we are in such a providential moment where God has almost drawn a line in the sand. And he said, right, enough is enough here. Enough is enough. Enough is enough of you doing this in your own strength. Enough is enough of you doing this and continually failing and falling at every hurdle. Yes, we've seen measures of blessing here and there, but nothing with regards to what God wants to pour out in these days. And so I've been thinking much about what should I share today. And yesterday 
I was in the house of prayer in Portadown and I had a message all sorted and planned out and I just thought to myself after two, three, four hours or whatever it was of study, this isn't it. And so I just thought today I would come on and share my heart. And if you have a Bible with you, I do hope you have a Bible present, that you would just take a moment to turn to Psalm 126. Psalm 126. And during the week, I was lying in bed, to be honest, and I was kind of reflecting on all of the, the things that are transpiring before our eyes. And, and I was just thinking about the things that I would long to see happen in our land, in our towns, in our cities, in our homes especially, in my own personal life. And I just felt the whisper of the Holy Spirit. I just felt him ask me this question, Mark, what is your dream? What is the dream that you have deep within your heart? What would you long to see? What is your dream? And I want to ask you that question here today. What is your dream? What is the deep longing of your heart? What is the deep conviction of your soul? What is it you're longing for, looking for, crying out for? Over this past 10 days or so, we've been meeting in the mornings just to kind of meditate on the Holy Spirit, to meditate on the truth of God's Word. And, and I've been hearing this, this cry erupting from the body of Christ, this cry, this longing, this groaning, Oh God, we need you, and more than need you, but Lord, we want you. We're so desperate for more. We've had enough, we're fed up, we're, this life that we're living, we're not really living it. We're, we're almost just existing. It's almost like we're just getting by day by day, but we're not pressing into the greater of God. The things that he has promised, and especially the promise from the Father, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So what is your dream? What are you longing for? You see, in Psalm 126, and I'm reading out of the Passion Translation today, the psalmist says this, It was like a dream come true. It was like a dream come true when you freed us from our bondage and brought us back to Zion. It was like a dream come true. And what's the psalmist saying here? You see, the nation of Israel, the whole nation of Israel have been taken captive by the Babylonian Empire. The whole nation, this just wasn't a few individuals that were taken captive, it was the whole nation. And some of the theologians will, will tell us that this was actually scribed, this was written by Ezra, the scribe. He, he reflected on the moment of this great nation's deliverance on the moment in which this nation stepped into freedom. So here we have it. It was like a dream come true when you freed us from our bondage. I don't know about you, but I've been imagining a world. I've been imagining even my world free from my besetting sins, free from the things that so weigh me down, free from the difficulties that I've been experiencing in my own life personally. I've been imagining what my marriage would be like when it's full of the Holy Spirit, full of the fruit of the Spirit, full of the power and presence of Jesus. I've been imagining what the church of Jesus Christ will look like when she comes into her true identity and true calling in Christ. When she steps into the very thing, that, that, that beautiful inheritance that Jesus Christ has paid for by his own blood. I've imagined towns and cities transformed by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. I've imagined the nation of Ireland, this glorious nation of Ireland, transformed by the power and presence of Jesus. What would that look like? What does that look like in your mind's eye? I have a dream. I have a dream about revival. I have a dream about a great awakening. I have a dream about God moving and his spirit been released through this land, putting everything into order, aligning everything with heaven, 
that heaven itself would come and find a resting place on this land. I have a dream. And not only do I have a dream, (laughs) but God has a dream too. God has a dream too. And the Lord in heaven has been dreaming about you, been dreaming about you before you were ever born. He's been dreaming about you. He has great and glorious plans for us all. He has wonderful dreams. He has a dream especially about his church. And let's look into what that dream looks like for a moment. And he alludes to this in Ephesians chapter 3. This is, this is God's heart. This is God's dream for his church, for his beautiful body. Our reconciling peace is Jesus He made Jew and non-Jew one in Christ by dying as our sacrifice. He has broken down every wall of prejudice that separates us and has now made us equal through our union with Christ. Ethnic hatred has been dissolved by the crucifixion of his precious body on the cross. The legal code that stood condemning every one of us has now been replaced by his command. The triune essence has made peace between us by starting over, forming one new race of humanity. Jew and non-Jew fused together. Protestant and Catholic fused together. Muslim and Hindu fused together. It does not matter what ethnicity you're from. God's plan, God's dream is to have one united body in Jesus. That's his heart. And I'll be honest with you, coming from denominational Christianity, I have no idea what that looks like. I have no concept of what true unity in Jesus looks like. But I'm prepared, I hope and I pray, to leave behind my own ideas and my own imaginations about this and enter into God's dream, enter into Jesus' way. His way is the only way. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter about my opinions. There's only one opinion that matters. And that's the opinion of Jesus and the heart of the Father. And I so long to enter into that. It was like a dream come true when you freed us from our bondage and brought us back to Zion. Back to the holy city. Back to Jerusalem itself. And I don't know about you, but I have this echo in my soul. And it's an echo back to the past. It's an echo back to Celtic Christianity. It's it's an echo back to how we were born brought to bear in this land how how christianity came forth in ireland and of course it came by the apostle patrick and there was something very very prevalent and very important and something glorious that those apostles those early apostles established in this land men and women note men and women who were anointed by the power of the Spirit of God, who moved out in power, seen signs and wonders, seen incredible miracles happen. They brought the gospel to this land. That's our heritage, brother and sister. That's our heritage. That's where we come from. And just like in this psalm, they were brought back to Zion. And I think, I could be wrong, but I think we're being brought back to our heritage. We're being brought back to Celtic Christianity, if I can If I can say that, we're not being brought back to a denomination. We're not being brought back to a movement as such. We've been brought back to the movement, the one true movement, and that is Celtic Christianity. It's what happened at the very beginning. It's how Christianity came to this land. We laughed and laughed and overflowed with gladness. We were left shouting for joy and singing your praise. All the nations saw it and joined in saying, The Lord has done great miracles for them. Yes, he did mighty miracles and we are overjoyed. It's interesting, you know, that all 
the nations saw what happened to the nation of Israel. It sent a vibration throughout the world. All the other nations seen the hand of God moving on its beloved people and restoring a nation back to himself, bringing it out of the clutches of bondage, bringing it out of the clutches of darkness and restoring this great city of Zion. You know, I have a dream, brother and sister. I have a dream of God invading your life. I have a dream of God coming into your circumstance and rectifying that which is wrong, making right that which is wrong. I have a dream of God moving in a mighty way, bringing healing and deliverance into your home, into your marriage, in ways in which you've never imagined. But it's going to happen, brother and sister. It's going to happen. And as that happens, other people are going to see what God has done. Just like it's been declared, the Lord has done great miracles for them. Other nations, other people will see what God is doing in the midst of his church. And that will be the thing that draws people to the body of Christ. It's what God does in your life. And that's why this moment in which we live, brother and sister, please hear my heart today. That's why this moment in which we live is such a holy moment. It's been ordained by God. The providence, the providential hand of God is all over this moment and we dare not miss it. Even for me to preach today, even for me to, to say what I believe I have to say is, is, is a God-fearing thing. Because I feel the weight of this moment. And that's why I'm imploring you, if you like, to pay attention, to wake up, to not miss what God is doing here. Because this moment will chart the rest of your life. This moment will set a course for the rest of your days here on earth. And so we dare not miss it. Because it's not just about us, you know. This is not just about us getting healed up. Yes, of course, those things are wonderful. And I've just said that those things are going to happen. But the greater picture is God wants to do something in our land. He wants to do something in our nation. He wants to do something in this beautiful Isle of Ireland. (laughs) This Isle of Ireland that has been visited in the past. Do you realise that you live on a visited land on a visited island, the Spirit of God has fallen in this place in previous years and in previous centuries. That this land has been used as a template to display the glory of the Lord to other nations in the world. The importance of this moment, brother and sister, it's vital. It's vital that you get a hold of it. In verse 4, Listen to these words. Now, Lord, do it again. (laughs) Restore us to our former glory. What does that former glory look like? Let's just turn in a moment. Or turn in a moment, please, to Acts chapter 2. And I'm just going to read this to you. And I don't have any notes today as I'm speaking to you. I'm just simply sharing my heart with you. And I'm just going to read this slowly. And I'm doing this on a Wednesday afternoon, by the way, so I have no idea what's going to happen on Sunday. And I'm just trusting and praying and expecting in my heart that as we read this together, as, as we contemplate the moment that we're in, that something divine would happen, that the sacred breath breath of heaven would fall in your home and that you would experience the transformative power of Jesus. This is our former glory. On the day of Pentecost, or on the day of Pentecost, yes, was fully come. All the disciples were gathered in one place. Suddenly, they heard the sound of a violent blast of wind rushing into the house. From out of the heavenly realm, 
The roar of the wind was so overpowering, it was all anybody could bear. Then all at once, a pillar of fire appeared before their eyes. It separated into tongues of fire that engulfed each one of them. They were all filled and equipped with the Holy Spirit and were inspired to speak in tongues, empowered by the Spirit to speak in languages they had never learned. My dear brother and sister, what we have read today is the birth of the church. What we have read today is your spiritual heritage. And I just want to ask you a question. Have you had an encounter with the Holy Spirit? I just want you to know something. I just want you to know something. Something that has touched my heart in these days. If you turn to Luke's Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, and in verse 49, and these are the words of Jesus to his disciples before he departed into heaven. He says this, And I will send the fulfillment of the Father's promise to you. So stay here in the city until the mighty power of heaven falls upon you and wraps around you. I want you to notice one statement here. That this is the Father's promise. This is what your Papa God in heaven has promised you as his child. This is his promise and he intends to fulfill his promise. And he's always wanted to fulfill his promise. He's always wanted to baptize and fill you with the Holy Spirit. The problem is, like me, like me, we haven't waited. We haven't waited. You see, we're so very keen to do verse 47 of that same chapter. Now you must go into all the nations and preach repentance and forgiveness of sins so that they will turn to me. Start right here in Jerusalem. For you are my witnesses and have seen for yourselves all that has transpired. You see, we're so very keen to do the go of the commission. Go into all the world. We're so very keen to do it. We've been doing that for so long. That's why we're all burned out. We're weary. We're fed up. We've had enough. And God has put a stop to it. (laughs) He's put a stop to it. And now he's put us into this waiting period. Where these disciples, they waited They waited for the fulfillment of the Father's promise. And that's what's happening, brother and sister. That's simply what's happening. And I was thinking, you know, this week about the Father's promise. Um, My little girl, Heidi, she's got a little toy at home. It's like a, a wee toy that plays music and stuff. And she hits the top of it. She punches the top of it. And it plays music and she dances around the living room. She loves it. But this week it ran out of juice. It ran out of power. (laughs) The batteries totally dead and daddy promised uh, Heidi came but not working I said okay darling I will get you new batteries for this toy I promised her new batteries she came she made her request father I need batteries I went yesterday got batteries came home put them in the toy hit the top of the button and boom such An amazing joy came over the wee girl's heart. She just loved it. I fulfilled the promise. I fulfilled the promise. Isn't there a verse in scripture where Jesus declares about the good father in heaven? If ye being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father Give the Holy Spirit to them that ask of him. And so very simply, this this week, I, I have just been positioning myself before him and asking as a son to a father, Father, give me the same power as you gave to those Galilean fishermen. Give me the same power to fulfill your commission. Lord, I'm sick and tired of doing the commissioning, of doing the go of doing the gospel without power, without power. And so we need, brother and sister, to be clothed with power from on high. 
I'm just going to simply read the rest of this psalm and then we're finished. May streams of your refreshing flow over us until our dry hearts are drenched again. I just want to read that for a moment. And even if you're at home now, as I read this to you, I just ask maybe you might put your hands out in front there. You might just enter into receive mode from Jesus. You might just take a moment to still your heart before him. May streams of your refreshing flow over us until our dry hearts are drenched again. I don't know about you, brother and sister, but my heart is dry. I need the streams of living water to flood my soul again. I need him to pour out water on those who are thirsty. I need the Holy Spirit. And the beautiful thing is this, there's a very simple outcome to this. Those who sow their tears as seed will reap a harvest with joyful shouts of glee. They may weep as they go out carrying their seed to sow, but they will return with joyful laughter and shouting with gladness as they bring back armloads of blessing and a harvest overflowing. That's revival, folks. That's awakening. That's what we're crying out for. And that is the difference. It's as simple as this. That's the difference the Holy Spirit makes. I'm done with the programs. I'm done with the planning. I'm done with all of these things. I just want God's heart on this. And I cannot do this without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so Lord, I just pray right now in Jesus' name that as we are gathered around our TV sets, our phones, whatever device or however we are listening to this broadcast today, Lord of heaven and earth, would you come into our midst? Would you transform your people this day? Would they sense the moving and the power of the Holy Spirit? Oh, sacred wind from heaven, would you come? Would you fill us? Would you change us? Would you transform us? Would you touch us again, Holy Spirit? the divine one from heaven, the third minute, third member of the triunity of heaven, would you come again? Would you come again now, Lord? Do it again. Restore us to our former glory so that you would have your way, so that you, Lord, would receive all the glory and all the honor, for you are worthy of it all. King Jesus, you are worthy of it all. And so, Lord, I simply bless every heart that is listening today. And, Father, may this find a resting place. May your word find a resting place. And may you stir up our spirits like you did in the days of Zerubbabel. You stirred up the spirits of the people. You stirred up our spirits, Lord to see the wonders and glory and majesty of who you truly are. And so on this day of Pentecost, we're asking, Lord Jesus, send the promise of the Father. Send the promised Holy Ghost. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. As always, if you'd like to respond to anything that you've heard during the message today, please don't hesitate to get in contact. Our Facebook channel and our email address will be on the screen. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we're happy to answer questions. We don't have all the answers, but we, we can point you to one that does. Um, we trust that you have a great week and we trust that God's blessing will be upon you.